You know, we're seeing God do some amazing things in New York City. My wife, Julie, was tearing it up, just throwing down preaching today uh, with my, and my daughters, Bella and Everly. You know, Bella saved Everly. We're, we're praying for her. Um, she's very independent. She's seven years old, going on 45. And she's our executive pastor. Like on the drive over, she's always um, telling me what to do and how to do it. So we're working on her. But um, New York City is an amazing place. I'm originally from Indiana, so I'm 50% hillbilly. I don't know if we have any hillbillies here. Or we got a couple of them. Okay. Okay. Security team, watch them. Watch them. They're the wild ones. But in, uh, in, you know, I felt a call to go to New York City and start a church. We started with 18 people in a house and it just began to grow. And I, I don't, now that I look back, I don't know that all 18 were even saved, um, but they just felt like God was doing something and they wanted to be a part of it. And we ended up launching three campuses within our first three years. But I was telling uh, Pastor Vlad that it, it was actually atheists, Hindus, agnostics, and Muslims turning to Christ. Christ and getting saved in New York City. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You know, and when you all were praying for the 1040 window, I got a revelation. It suddenly hit me. I'm like, wait a second. For the ones from the 1040 window who are foolish enough to fly to New York City to visit their friends and family, I'm there waiting for them. I'm like, come to Papa. I've been waiting for you. And you know, we just had a baptism a couple weeks ago where I had the privilege of baptizing a formerly, I have to remember to say this, formerly Muslim young girl in her 20s. And she, she turned to Christ and now she signed up for ministry training at the college we have. And I, it was just an amazing testimony in the making. And she had family members who came to see her get baptized. That's scandalous. That's scandalous. Isn't the true unadulterated kingdom of heaven scandalous? I mean, isn't it just amazing? And, and you know, we had a guy recently, um, this was like insane story. <laughs> I, you know, when you do church and you're used to the way church is done, you oftentimes forget what it's like to be a guest, right? And so, you know, you go to these services where at the end they say, if you want to accept Christ, just raise your hand. Have you ever seen that happen in a service? Well, I look all the way in the back of the rafters. I see this six foot three, big, beautiful brown man, this Indian man, except for instead of doing this, he's waving both hands like he's going to land an airplane. <laughs> And so, you know, he comes down and he accepts Christ as his savior. And afterwards, I'm like, well, let me get your story. What happened? He's like, my name's Ayush and I am a multi-generational Hindu, and I am first-generation American. But my father, my biological dad, just recently passed away. And my friend invited me to church. And when you kept saying that God is our father, I can't explain what I felt, but I felt a love that I never felt from my biological father. And, and he literally said, I may, I may have been raised Hindu, but I could not deny what I experienced. And now I serve Jesus. And weeks later, I baptized him. He shot up out of the water, baptized with the Holy Spirit and water. And God is saving Hindus in New York City. Do you believe he can do it in Washington? Do you believe he can do it in your hometown watching online? Come on, let a testimony be the spirit of prophecy that says, God, do it again. Can somebody just shout, do it again? Come on, there's not a Walmart, a Target, or a grocery store safe if some hungry gen people are in it. Because we don't care if you're Hindu, agnostic, atheist, you're going to leave a disciple. Ah! It's that drummer. I believe in divine disruptions. You might be in one right now. Divine disruptions. It's somebody inviting their Hindu friend to V1 Church, and I introduce him to his true heavenly father. It's a Muslim that hears the gospel and starts to cry because she realizes that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was the Messiah. Divine disruptions. There's a young man named Joseph who is disrupted divinely by a dream. Do you know him? There's a young man, David, who is divinely disrupted by a giant-sized opportunity. 
Come on, you see it all throughout scripture. Then you've got Jonah chapter one. Matter of fact, I think Jonah is a spoiled brat, by the way. You know how hard it is to discover your purpose? You've read every book. You've went to every conference. In Jonah chapter one, God sovereignly speaks to him directly and says, go to Nineveh. What a spoiled brat. Wouldn't that be amazing? Go to hungry Jen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You've got this teenager, Mary, divinely disrupted by the angel messenger, Gabriel, who says, you have found favor among women. Come on, you've got Saul thinking he's doing the right thing. Come on, we just heard a testimony where she thought she was doing the right thing, going to psychic mediums, trying to figure it out. See, sometimes many of us are like, oh, I would never be a Pharisee, but you're a Pharisee. If you think you're doing the right thing, but haven't received a revelation from the Holy Spirit. And so Saul thinking he do, he's doing the right thing. How many of us went to church for years thinking we were doing the right thing, but, but a car in a garage does not, come on, standing in a garage does not make you a car, just like standing in this building does not make you a true believer. And so oftentimes we need a Damascus Road divine disruption. Divine disruption. See, God will actually bring a divine disruption to counteract a demonic distraction. And see, many of us are experiencing demonic distractions our entire life. We're raised in families with abuse. We're raised around drug use and alcohol abuse. And we have these things that we suffer with. And we have these demonic distractions all around us. The pandemic felt like a demonic distraction to me in New York City. But see, sometimes when you rise up in boldness, you say, I see another opportunity. I see another way. I started holding a phone to my face and casting demons out of people through Facebook because I was so mad. I said, if I can't show up in a building, I'm gonna show up in every house that will turn their phone on and let me in to cast demons out. It's a divine disruption. Have you ever encountered a divine disruption where you can definitively say there was my life before that moment and there was my life after that moment? Has anybody been in a divine disruption? See, everything visible and physical, everything that you can experience through your senses, everything that you can smell, touch, taste, everything that you can see is interacting with what has been preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. Sometimes you're like Daniel. There's warfare happening in the heavenlies. You think that God has delayed, but it hasn't yet manifested in the physical reality. I believe that there is something that had been stirring, something that had been happening in the spiritual realm before you got here today, whether you logged on to YouTube or you're in the room, and I think some things are about to manifest in the physical scene realm today. Come on. If you want to address that which is visible and physical, you must identify the cause and the cure to what is invisible and spiritual. A lot of people don't believe that their problems are demons until demons start manifesting. In New York, I went from being weird to being a genius. (laughs) They said, I went to every doctor and they couldn't help me. And I said, I know the great physician, he can. They, they, they tried every other world religion. They tried everything else and they couldn't find peace. Our church is full of entrepreneurs that have private jets and mansions that are bigger than most church buildings, but they didn't have peace because they didn't have Jesus. And, and so people are like, what's your strategy for church growth? I'm like, it's, we're not a 21st century church. We're a first century church doing it again. The same power, that resurrection power that was on display is on display. I see it in this house. Let me put it another way. If all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. (laughs) Can I say that again? If all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. There's more. There's more. Oh, I feel something stirring in my stomach right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Now, we're going to go deep into the scriptures. Do I have anyone who really wants to dive deep into the word with me today? 
Because I love to scream preach, but I'll scream theology and I'll, I'll scream good doctrine to you today too. And I believe that God wants us to feast on the meat of the word. I've been wrestling with this, fasting, praying, leading into this because I feel like there is such a massive download for Hungry Gen today. There's something that God's gonna do in you and through you that's gonna change you. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 18 says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that are unseen are eternal. Hey, 12 spies, they look into Canaan. Guess what? They were all right. The 10 who said that what I, based on what I see, it's not possible. They were right. They died and never stepped in. But the two who said, I see that it's possible, they lived to see it, Joshua and Caleb. So here's the thing. Whether you believe it can be done or you don't, you're all right. So the question is, who's going to take Hungry Jen and what we're doing in this house to another level and say, I see the vision our pastor just cast? Come on, does anybody else believe it? <laughs> I was 15 years old. I want you to imagine me with a big curly mop of hair right now. Can you see it? In your... <laughs> I was 15 years old. I was the product of multiple uh, abusive stepdads and extreme poverty. I come from nothing. My biological father beat my mother and then divorced her when I was a baby and then killed a man a couple years later and went to jail. So that's my pedigree. That's my family. That's my genes. And um, that's where I come from. I was born and raised in a trailer park, extreme poverty. And my mother was one of those generational bloodline curse breakers. Does anybody, maybe, maybe there's one here right now that says it may run in my family, but I'm where it runs out. I'm talking to the Moses, the Moses who said, we may not have stepped into the promised land, but we're certainly not in Egypt anymore. And see, my mother, she, she didn't know anything about Pentecostalism. Matter of fact, my mother was just hungry for the things of God. Her name is Sandra. We call her Moses. And so all these, these New Yorkers call her Pastor Moses. And it's like an inside joke. And I said, well, I'm Joshua. I'm meaner than her. But see, she started to go to a small Nazarene church and she began to ask about the Holy Spirit, whether it was real, because she actually made the mistake of reading her own Bible. Who would have thought? And the youth pastor told my mom, um, <laughs> I can't help you with that question. That's above my pay grade here in the Nazarene church. And sent her to the lead pastor. And the lead pastor said, honey, that's not for today. But she knew on the inside that that was not right. There was something more. See, there was something unseen. She didn't see the movement of the Holy Spirit in her Nazarene church, but by faith, she saw something and she knew that there was more. Matter of fact, her father, which is my grandfather, was passed out drunk in one room. And then my grandmother was drinking a beer next to her and my mother started playing the piano and she was just doing a worship song. This was over 40 years ago. And the Holy Spirit met her in a home. She began to speak in tongues. She began to cry. I mean, to the amazement of her family, they're like, what is happening with Sandra? And my grandmother said, I think she got the Holy Ghost that she won't stop talking about. That's, that's my heritage. So no, I'm not good at being religious. I don't come from that. I'm a wild one. I just know about the Holy Spirit that'll meet you in a home, that will meet you at your place of desire. And my mother started a legacy, but she had her own issues to work out. She was the bloodline curse breaker. I honor her as Moses to our family, but there were things that she had to work out. And so here I am 15 years old now, and I am the product of all that dysfunction that my mother has been struggling through. And you know, I had a praying mom and she would pray so loud at home, it was so annoying. <laughs> and I remember being almost like it was agonizing to hear it. There was something in my flesh. Now I know I needed deliverance, pastor. But at the time I was so annoyed by it. And then I'm the oldest of five kids. So my siblings, of course, were like, mom, let's pray. And they were the good ones. But I wanted to go upstairs to my room and play Mortal Kombat. So then we, had, we don't have any old school people here. So at 15 years old, I wouldn't have been the person on the front row worshiping. I was the person who slipped into the back row. I brought my little green screen, uh, my little green screen Game Boy. 
and I would play it in the back and I would completely ignore everything that was happening. But see, there was a godly heritage. How many of you believe that that you are the result of a praying mother, a praying grandmother, a praying grandfather. There was a godly heritage and it was calling me. And so, no, I wouldn't wouldn't do all the things that we did. I was raised in a Spanish church growing up. We were the only white family in a Spanish church. Cuanto saben que Dios está aquí? I was just checking the diversity levels here. (laughs) Dobre, dobre. (laughs) But... At 15 years old, I didn't do the things that my Pentecostal church did. I didn't want to be around the things of God. It was like my flesh and these demons that were inhabiting my soul, they were just holding me back. But but secretly, I started to do something. I started reading the Bible for myself. And every night, I would read the scriptures, and I fell in love with the scriptures. And I'll never forget Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. I kept going deeper and deeper, and I'll never forget, around 15 years old, I get all the way up to the book of Acts. Now I read about Acts chapter 2. And you know, it's a really riveting story if you read the Gospels and then get to the book of Acts, because you're like, that's Peter? That guy was such a flunky. That guy was so stupid. I think he was drunk sometimes. That's not in the Bible, but I just feel like you could smell Marlboro's on his breath. He was one of those guys. You know what I mean, Peter? And I'm like, what? What? And that was the very first time I prayed my most dangerous prayer. I think it was my first real one. I sat in my bed. I closed my Bible. I turned off my Super Nintendo at 15. And I said, God, if it's real... And if what I just read is real, if your Holy Spirit is real, I want your Holy Spirit. And at 15 years old in the privacy of my own bedroom, I had my personal Pentecost. Tears begin to roll down my face. I felt, I mean, I, I, I just, this didn't happen in reality, but I felt like a, a wind just begin to blow through the room. But I was so introverted, so uh, shy, painfully shy. I, I still deal with that sometimes. And, and I was struggling with all the abuse and the trauma from my past. So I had this personal Pentecost that no one knew about, but God, but God. And so what began to happen at 15 years old is I would sneak into the church, sneak out. I would avoid all these crazy people that I saw every week. But then one day I was sitting in the back row and church dismissed and I walked out at 15 years old and I got down the stairs and as I got down the stairs, this woman from the neighborhood, this was South Chicago. It's crazy. So South Chicago, this woman walks down the block and she looks at me and she goes, Santo, Espiritu Santo. Now listen, in South Chicago, there's a lot of crazy people. So when I saw her approach me, now her face turned ghost white like she saw ghosts. I mean, she's looking at me and I'm thinking to myself, like she's just one of those crazy people that my mom told me, don't look them in the eyes. (laughs) That's what I'm thinking. 15 years old, Mike Signorelli. And all of a sudden she begins to walk up closer to me and she looks at me and her hand starts trembling and she said, I I had a dream two nights ago. You were in my dream. And, and, and now I'm like, okay, she is crazy. She is crazy. So I'm like, now what do I do? I'm the first person out of the church. I'm all alone. And she was like, I, I had a dream. I had a dream. In my dream, you were preaching at my church. Revival broke out. All the young people got saved. There were healings. Demons were being cast out of people. Now that's very inspiring but not to someone who's broken and traumatized and introverted. That's scary. So this, this is what I told this woman. I said, th- th- I said, woman, no offense. This is how I said it, okay? I, I said, woman, you're crazy. I know I have facial hair because I'm Italian, but I'm 15 years old and I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you walk away from me now? And she was like, no, I know. I know what I saw. This woman at 15 years old, I was experiencing a divine disruption. I was experiencing one of those moments where God refuses to allow you to be left alone with yourself. One of those moments where he just begins to speak into the epicenter of your pain because this woman that I never met before had a vision for me that I didn't have for myself and not even my Holy Ghost filled mother had for me. Matter of fact, If you would ask my mom, out of all my siblings, if I'd be the preacher, she'd say, there's no way. Not if you know Mike. 
Not if you know Mike. That woman, though, she scared me, and I hope to God she didn't take it any further. So I just got in the car. We drove home. But for the next two weeks, that woman who lived on the block of that local church would walk down and meet the pastor and tell her the story of the dream she had about the young man. And every day for two weeks, the pastor would say, you don't know Mike Signorelli. He hides in the back. He, he doesn't want anything to do with this. You, have, you don't know. And she's like, no, I never saw his face before. But when I saw his face, I know that this is to be done. For two weeks, this woman annoyed me. All of a sudden, two Sundays later, she comes after church and she grabs the pastor. The pastor pulls me into the office and now I'm alone with this woman. And all of a sudden, the woman, she literally tells the story again. The pastor's like, I know, I heard the story, I know. And she said, now Mike's here. Let Mike say it for himself because I know Mike and maybe his youth pastor can do this assignment. Maybe one of our associate pastors can do it, but he cannot do it. He literally said the words, but Mike can't do it. Okay, I want you to hold that story there. I'm going to get back to in eight or nine minutes, but I got to take you to 1 Kings chapter 21. Who has their Bible with them today? 1 Kings chapter 21. I'm going to read verse 21. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I'll give you a better vineyard or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. But Naboth, he replies boldly, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Verse four, so Ahab went home, sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and he refused to eat. Ahab had the complete opposite problem I have when I'm depressed. I eat too much. He refused to eat. Verse five, his wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? And he answered her, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, how many of you know that Ahab and Jezebel is also a spirit? I'm going to give you some very profound revelation. Stay with me. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you uh, the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters to Ahab in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. And in those letters she wrote, listen to this, proclaim a day of fasting. And seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him. In other words, I'm just going to tell you this right now. She declares fasting and says, seat two scoundrels next to Naboth. In other words, these were church folks. Just hold that. And have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Verse 11, so the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth city did as Jezebel directed in the letters she had written to them. Verse 12, they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth saying, uh, you know, he cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. They were sent word back. Now they sent word back to Jezebel. Naboth has been stoned to death. We know, according to the Bible, that the enemy is sneaky. He's compared as a serpent. Serpents do not have good eyesight, so they rely on their senses. We know that the devil is also a strategist. The devil says, you know, the, the Bible says we're not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. Why? Because he's a strategist. He, we also know that the devil is an opportunist. He, he'll actually withdraw from our life and he'll wait for the opportune time and then he will enter in seeking whom he may devour. We know this. Come on, how many of you know this? Are we equipped today? 
So this is more than an incident in a vineyard. This is more than a real estate deal that's going down in 1 Kings chapter 21. We know this, why? Because the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a vineyard. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus refers to himself as the Lord of what? The vineyard. In John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. You have to be connected to the vine in order to be what? Fruitful. So this is more than just a story about a vineyard. This is more than just a real estate deal. And I want to give you a little bit of historical background. Can I do that? This man named Naboth is from the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh, if you remember, is the son of Joseph. Joseph is the son of Jacob. So you might remember that Jacob, as he's dying, begins to speak a promise over, the son, over uh, his son Joseph. And he says, you will be a fruitful vine. Joseph receives this promise from his father. Then he goes and he buys a piece of land. He makes it into a vineyard and passes it down to Manasseh. Then Manasseh begins to have many sons. This is how you get the tribe of Manasseh. Okay, are you following me? And then five generations later, there's an inheritance. And Naboth receives this inheritance And guess what Naboth's name means? Fruitful. He's literally living in his prophetic destiny. Naboth is standing in the thing that has been promised and passed down for five generations, okay? It's five generations of blessing. It's five generations of promise. Naboth is born to be fruitful, okay? There's this prophetic promise on his life. I believe that you were born to be fruitful. Does anybody else believe that today? You you were born to be fruitful. And Ahab says, I want that vineyard but I, I want it because it's adjacent to my palace and he's looking down and he was like I need a vegetable garden for my chefs I want to take a five generation promise that's going to continue through this line and I want to turn the vineyard into a vegetable garden This is how sneaky and subtle the enemy is it's almost as if if you don't look in the scripture here you'll completely miss it you'll completely miss it Ahab is saying, I want you to give up your vineyard for vegetables. Can I put it on another way for the note takers? I want you to give up the extraordinary for the ordinary. I want you to give up the God idea for a good idea. I want you to exchange great for good. I want you to exchange the eternal for the temporal. I want you to, I want you to exchange the spiritual for the material. I want you to take the miraculous and the majestic and just exchange it for the mundane. Come on to somebody. I want you to exchange God's provision and his blessing for just survival. He's saying, I want you to give me this vineyard and turn it into a vegetable garden. You know, vegetables, there's nothing wrong. Nobody would say that there's anything demonic about vegetables except for my seven-year-old Everly. But they represent mediocrity, settling, thinking that my marriage will probably only be this good. Oh, I wish I had some real people with me today. Oh, our ministry can only go this far in, in one lifetime. It's, it's exchanging the miraculous for the mundane. Naboth says, I cannot allow that to happen because that's not what's best. You know, the apostle Paul shows up and he tells the church at Thessalonica, he says, still continue to excel more. I know you've seen miracles. I know you've seen deliverances happen on your altar. But Paul tells Thessalonica, just excel more. How many of you believe for more? You're believing that there's more, that that we haven't seen our best service here at Hungry Chen. Come on, that we haven't preached our best sermon, that there's more, there's more. Paul said, excel even more the vineyard was God's best Naboth wasn't called to vegetables he was called to the vineyard I believe that hungry gen is a vineyard from the for the world and it's going to supply the wine of the Holy Spirit to the nations from this place and we are not going to give Ahab and Jezebel this vineyard and turn it into vegetable gardens we believe that we are in a vineyard Jesus' first miracle was not turning water into a kale smoothie. 
I'm not hating on vegetables. As you can tell, I don't eat that many. But his first miracle was turning water into what? Wine. Wine. It's not the vegetables of the Spirit. It's the fruits of the Spirit. See, the, the devil loves to get us to surrender our vineyard for vegetables. Oh, just go ahead and stay sick. Just keep managing the pain with medication. Uh, at least you're still alive. See how subtle he is? Well, well, at least you're still married. Ne never mind the fact that your marriage has a purpose and a destiny by God, but at least you can just still hold on. And Ahab arranges a meeting with Naboth and tries to negotiate a price. But Naboth ref refuses. There is no price. I will not give you my vineyard. God forbids me that I do this. Remember, Satan took Jesus on the mountaintop. And he said, I would love for you to exchange your vineyard for a vegetable garden. Jesus said, no, I, I can't do that because the cross that is set before me, I see something in the spiritual realm. I see something that hasn't happened yet. I see multitudes that are yet to be saved in the generations to come. And I would never give up what God had called me to, to turn it into a vegetable garden. Jezebel comes to Ahab and finds him depressed, sulking, emo. She comes up with a plan and writes a letter with two things in the letter that I want to draw your attention to as we break down this text. I will bring Naboth to a prominent place, and then I will bring him to men who are scoundrels. How many of you know that when God wants to change your levels, he changes your circles? Oh, when he wants to take you higher, he'll bring you into a new circle of friends. But how many of you know when the devil wants to take you lower, he will also change your circles? See, when somebody comes into your life, they're not just bringing a body, they're bringing a spirit. And so you've got to ask yourself the question, what spirit are they bringing into my life? Oh, I wish you heard me today. And that's why it's so important that you're here in the house of God, whether it's on Zoom, in a chat, or in the room, because God has to change your circles to change your levels. Sometimes you've only gotten as far as you can go. And people, God does this crazy thing. He'll take an introvert like me and hide the keys to unlock the chains that bind me in a crazy woman in South Chicago with a dream. See, my own mother didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. But he hid that in somebody else. See, God was going to introduce somebody in my life. What you see, and it's the tactic of the enemy through the spirit of Jezebel to take and rob the vineyard and turn it into a vegetable garden. Jezebel says, I'll take him to a prominent place. I will give him a false success. I'll give Naboth a job that's just good enough to pay the bills that they'll never believe for their destiny. I'll take Naboth into a circle of friends that just comfort them just enough to keep them conformed and comforted. Whew. I'll bring him to a prominent place and I'll surround them by scoundrels. These scoundrels were church folk. <laughs> they had been fasting. Have you ever read it like that? Sometimes it's, in, it's, sometimes it's even the people. Maybe you came out of other ministries, came from other churches, surrounded, surrounded by scoundrels. Don't tag them in the chat. <laughs> when someone enters your life, you've got to understand that they're not just bringing their physical body you have to see in the spirit realm, they're bringing a spirit. Demonic distractions come in the form of people, but so do divine disruptions. So all of a sudden, I'm standing, and, and, and I just need you to understand this. 15-year-old Mike Signorelli, and I'm in the office with my pastor, and my pastor says, you don't understand to this woman. You don't understand. He cannot do it. But see, I had been baptized with the Holy Spirit privately and it was about to manifest publicly because all of a sudden, this stuttering, stammering, I mean, I'm talking totally introverted young man. I said, yes, I'll do it. I can do it. Then after I said, I was like, whoa, what did I just say? I started to sweat like I'm sweating now. And the woman was like, what? He changed his mind. The pastor's like, what? You're going to do this? I said, yes, I'll do it. How many of you know when you receive the boldness of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit, he'll empower you to do things that you didn't ever think you can do? So at 15 years old, 
My dad is literally in jail. I come from nothing, no seminary training. I just know the Bible that I had spent the previous year reading and I've got the Holy Spirit. I show up to this woman's church. I had to borrow a suit because I didn't even own a suit and you could only preach in suits back in the day. Do you remember that? And the suit was so big, it didn't even cover me. I mean, it was like all over drooping, sagging and looked like a zoot suit, like I was a gangster. And all of a sudden I got up there. I read my text. For the first 15 and 20 seconds, I was nervous. And then all of a sudden, the gift of God was unlocked in me. The only way I can explain it is I felt like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. I began to speak with wisdom, knowledge, and revelation far beyond my years. It was like my brain had to catch up with my spirit because my spirit started running with the gift of God. Before I know it, come on, somebody. Before I know it, the young people are getting saved. They're saying, I want Jesus. Revival starts breaking out. Old people start coming forward every generation. And it was just like that woman's dream, but this is the craziest part. The entire altar is full. And as the altar is full of people, I have no idea what I'm doing. No formal training. It's the first sermon I ever preached. And all of a sudden, I begin to lay hands and pray for for people. That woman who had the dream, she comes up with her daughter. Her daughter is about four years old. She's carrying her on her side. Her daughter was born with a decrepit hand. So zero mobility, zero function or usage of her hand. And that same woman who had a dream brought her daughter. And she said, can you pray for my daughter? This is the last part of my dream. I had no idea what I was doing. If anything, I'm more of a professional now than I've ever been. I still don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) But a simple yes, an act of obedience to say, God, I'm already out in the deep waters. Meet me here. I'm already all in, God. I I refuse to allow my vineyard to be turned to a vegetable garden. I'm not going to allow the pain and trauma of my past to cancel the victorious future that he has for me. I'm not going to let my lack of financial resources and lack of knowledge cancel the future. And so all of a sudden, I begin to lay my hand on this daughter. I kid you not, this was the very first, but not the last miracle I saw God do. That young girl's hand shot forth like this. And I'm telling you, the place went completely crazy. I mean, pandemonium, screaming. And it wasn't the kind of screaming like, yeah, this is an amazing service. It was like part fear of God was installed. Like when that girl's hand came forth, it was like people were screaming in utter terror that God has revealed himself into a level and extent that they had never seen. That's how I started my preaching career. A divine disruption. A divine disruption. Just a guy who said yes, who believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that this is your divine disruption today. I believe that this church is about to mobilize into a whole nother season. I believe I'm here to shake some things up. I'm here to speak to a spirit of Ahab and Jezebel and say not one of us under the sound of my voice is going to give up this vineyard for a vegetable garden. I'm going all the way. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm not going to accept any less than the fullness of what God has. I want the miraculous. And just like Gabriel showed up to Mary. I'm here to show up to you today and say I've stood in the presence of God and I've got a word for you today. Come on. Just like God spoke to Jonah. It's time to speak to the Ninevites. I'm here on assignment to disrupt something. It's not business as usual. It's not just another service. It's a divine disruption. A divine disruption. A divine disruption. A divine disruption. I want to give you one more thing. You can just stay on your feet if you like because we're about to go in. I'm telling you right now, I want to activate you. I want to impart something. I literally was telling your pastor, I have been with John Maxwell and all these renowned guys, and they're like, tell me your story. I'm like, you don't want to hear my story (laughs) because all I know is complete and total faith in him. All I know is reliance on him. All I know is to say, God, I believe it's a yes, and I'll keep giving you my yes. See, something you need to understand in nature is that a lot of times we have this, oh, can I just say what's on my heart? I feel this so strongly. 
I know the difference between 99% submission and 100. I know the difference between going through the charades of killing your Isaac and then actually preparing and then going through the motion of killing him. Because somebody who's gone all in for the Lord can always tell when somebody's holding something back. And that 1% is enough to turn your vineyard into a vegetable garden. That 1% is enough, that little bit of compromise, that little bit of mediocrity to say, well, I'll just content to be a part of it and watch it all go down. No, no, you're not supposed to watch it. You're supposed to lead it. You're supposed to be a participant. You're supposed to get up off the bench and go. And what happens in nature is it's like you, you, you have these lions that they go and they hunt together. And as the leader of the pack ages, in his roar, it begins to lower. His vocal cords are wore out and it becomes the most terrifying sound that you've ever heard. And as they're going out in a pack to hunt, they find the prey. And it's strategic and you can study this in nature. The old lion roars as loud as he can and the terrifying sound of that roar causes the prey to run away. But see, when he runs away, the younger ones who are agile come and, and they say, well, we're gonna take this prey now and then we'll bring them back and feed them to the older lion. But see, there's a secret here that if there was enough courage in that prey to run towards the roar, what they would find when they got there is that old lion has lost his teeth. That old lion has lost his agility. And the safest place for the prey is not to run away from the roar, but to run toward the roar. How many of you know that if you run toward the enemy, you'll find that Jesus already conquered death, hell, and the grave. If you'll run toward the roar, if you'll say, I, not by might nor by power, but my my spirit, the safest place is to run right into the impossibility, right into the thing that they say is not possible, right into it. Naboth dies in the story. Naboth dies because he tried to hold his ground. But Naboth made one mistake. He did the right thing by saying, I will not give my vineyard. But remember, the enemy is subtle. The mistake he made is he called it his vineyard. It was never his vineyard. It was God's. It was a blessing handed down from Joseph five generations. So all of a sudden, Elijah gets the call. God says, Elijah, go to the vineyard. See, the presence of Naboth produced the absence of Elijah. But when there's the absence of Naboth, there's the presence of the spirit of Elijah. Oh, there's a revelation on this. Elijah shows up and he says, Ahab and Jezebel, you're going to be fed to the hounds of heaven. Come on, you know the story. And he begins to execute judgment on them from that place of a vineyard. But see, what that's symbolic of is you have to say, I didn't ask to be a preacher, but there was something divinely deposited in my life. This is not my gift. It's a gift he gave me that I use for his glory, to make his name great, to lift him up. And if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. And so this is not my vineyard. It's not my marriage. A threefold cord, it's not easily broken. It's me and Julie and Jesus engrafted in. This is not my ministry. This is his ministry. This is not my business. I'm a kingdom builder. It belongs to him. Multi-generational wealth will flow to steward the gifts of God on earth because it's his it's his can somebody shout amen if you believe what I'm saying so I've come here today with that same resurrection power the spirit of Elijah that that spirit that says I'm standing in this vineyard to say, we are going all the way now, baby. We are going all the way. They told me in New York, they said, you'll never have thir more than 30 people in New York. I said, there's 10 million lost souls going to hell, and I'm going to smell like smoke as I clutch every single one of them out of the bowels and the clutches of the enemy. Come on, you don't tell somebody with the Holy Spirit what can't be done. Come on, it's fuel. When you say it can't be done, it's fuel. You don't know my God. You don't know my Savior. You don't know my Jesus. All things. Somebody shout back to me, all things. All things. 
all things, every sickness, every disease, every demon, all things. Somebody shout all things. I got a question. Who's going to run toward the roar? Who's going to run toward the roar? Who's going to run toward the roar? Who's going to believe that that things that medicine can't heal, that God can heal? You know, somebody said, let's pray for the Baptist church. I was laughing. There was a woman watching my broadcast who, man, I feel the power of God. Some of you are going to have to triple dip in these services today. She was watching my broadcast. She's on staff at a Baptist church. That's a super Baptist. (laughs) The Lord challenged me. And he said, Mike, we, he called me Pastor Mike. Every time he challenges me, he calls me by my title, Pastor Mike. I'm like, yes, Lord. He said, I dare you today on your broadcast to start praying for med- medically verifiable miracles. I said, I do that all the time. He said, no, no, you're playing it safe. You're only asking healing for things that you've already seen healed and that you think is possible. I want you to go deeper. There's a woman from a Baptist church on staff with MS. MS does not have any medical cure. All of a sudden on that broadcast, the Lord told me that neurodegenerative diseases were going to be healed. And I begin to speak into that over the broadcast. I, you know, you see the comments go by, you see the people's names, but you don't know what's happening. All of a sudden, months later, I get an email full of attachments. The attachments are all the medical verifications that the MS is completely gone. Completely gone. And she said, you divinely disrupted my pretty Baptist church because you're making it hard for me to contain myself because if I don't praise him for what he did, the rocks are going to cry out because I know my Jesus can do it. I know he can do it. Come on. Don't give up your vineyard for a vegetable garden. Don't try to control something with medication that God can heal through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood has not lost its power. That blood is still testifying. That blood is still cleansing. That blood is still healing. That blood has not lost its power. Just one drop was enough for the entire world. Come on, does anybody believe it? Here's what I want to do. There's a lot of people here. But I believe strongly that I'm to pray for many of you. There's an impartation. We've got a team here to pray, and I want to pray for you. And I believe God's going to do more throughout the entire day, but he specifically told me healings. So what I want to do right now is before we open up the altar, I want to pray for everybody front to back. Is that okay? Is that okay? Do you believe there's more? Paul said, excel, go deeper. (laughs) go deeper. There's more. There's more. Father, I thank you. You have been so faithful. You are not intimidated by pain. You are not intimidated by sickness. You are victorious, victorious, victorious. Father, I pray. Some of you are going to begin to encounter his presence in such a strong way. I'm I'm doing this on purpose because I don't want any credit coming to me. I don't want you to think it was because the man of God touched you. I want the Holy Spirit to do right where you're at before we take another step, what only he can do. So Father, right now, even people watching online, I want you to drop in the chat if something's happening right now. I speak to every bit of pain right now and I command it to go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. Every infirmity and sickness now, I break the power of it in Jesus' name. Every growth, every tumor, every cyst, I command it to shrink and disappear now under the sound of my voice. 
go in the name of Jesus. Go. Some of you, if you have tumors, cysts, if you have growths, I want you to begin to check them now. Check them now. I just had somebody where a wound that was open, doctors could not close the wound, and the wound miraculously closed in a session just like this. It was so dramatic that the doctor said that it was an enigma. They didn't have a better word. I said, you say enigma, I say miracle. Father, I thank you right now from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. I break the power of every spirit of infirmity now and command you to loose them and let them go. I command you to loose them and let them go now. Father, I thank you for healing, 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 healing. Barren wombs. This, this one's going to have a long wick on it. Come on, barren wombs. I speak right now. Cystic fibrosis. Gone. Gone. In the name of Jesus, and I release healing. I thank you that we will be fruitful and multiply in Jesus' name. Come on, this is a dangerous prayer. We had half a dozen couples at our church. The doctor said it's medically impossible for you to actually conceive, and we had to do spontaneous baby dedications in the last couple of weeks because we said it nine, ten months ago, and we're seeing the fruit of it today. So I speak to barren wombs now, and I release life, resurrection, healing power, in the name of Jesus. Just wave at me right now if you're feeling the Lord just moving in your body. Come on, just give me a wave. Praise God. Praise God. Strength. I just released supernatural strength in the name of Jesus. Supernatural strength. I believe the Holy Spirit will even quicken your body. And your, your very body, every cell, every fiber of your being will begin to be recharged. Sometimes when you go through trauma, depression, anxiety, fear, it takes a toll on your body. But I believe right now that God is reversing and restoring the toll that depression and anxiety and fear has taken in your body. If you receive it, would you just receive it by faith right now? coming out of a season. This is a divine disruption. I'm drawing the dividing line now, and here's what I want to do. As we come to a close, if you want to run toward the roar, if you want to step in, I dare you right now just to come forward to this altar and say, Pastor Mike, I'm ready to cross that line. I'm ready to go 100%. I'm ready to step in. This might not be for everybody, but I want to know who this is for. Somebody who says, I'm done playing games. Pastor Mike, I've been fooling a lot of people, but I know that I've been 99%. I've been 98%. I'm ready to go 100. I'm ready to surrender. Would you just come? Would you just come? Maybe there's a few more who say, I'm fighting for the vineyard. It's not my vineyard. It's God's vineyard. It's God's dream. Come on. I wonder if the least likely is represented here. I wonder if there's a Mike Signorelli. I wonder if there's somebody who says, I I came in skeptical. I I came in doubting, but I believe I've seen too much now. Come on, just stay here. If you're here on the front, I want you to just begin to pour out your heart. I want you to just get into a posture of surrender. I want you to just release it. Just turn it over. Just begin to pour out your heart. Just surrender. Just surrender. Just surrender. Just surrender. surrender. Not my will. Thy will be done. Not my plan, but your plan, God. There's such a sweet fragrance. There's just such a sweet aroma that comes from laying it down, surrendering, saying, God, divinely disrupt me. I'll step in. I'll step in. Come on, we're going to take just a few more moments. I'm going to begin to pray for people here in a few moments. 
that are here on the stage, but I want to do something. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, Con confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that he is Messiah. I told you the story about Ayush, my Indian friend. I told you this story about my Muslim friend, but it's possible to go to church and to say, Pastor Mike, to be honest with you, I I'm not living a life as if he's the Lord. I'm I'm I haven't been living that way. Oh yeah, sure, I, I get emotional during worship. Sure, I experience these moments, but I can't say that I've truly surrendered and that I am saved, that I am a true believer, but I wanna step over because I, I would be remiss. I've, I've preached at churches where literally the children's workers say, I've been doing the curriculum and I've been showing up every Sunday, but I don't know Jesus. I I'm not a Christian. And so I want to take an opportunity. If there's someone here, the greatest miracle is salvation. And I believe that there's maybe just a few, maybe they're watching online, a friend tagged them in the stream and they're like, I don't know what I just watched, but the Holy Spirit is drawing me. I know the truth now that Jesus is the Savior. Would you right now just say, Pastor Mike, I want to be led to Jesus. I want to accept him. Is there anyone? Just lift up your hand if that's you. I want to accept Jesus. I want to accept. Just lift it high so I can see it. Come on. Wow. Looks like even some people here up front. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Isn't that amazing, church? Isn't that amazing? Come on, they're making the best decision of their life. Okay, let's all pray this together as we celebrate somebody coming into this new season. It says win souls and makes disciples. I'd say we did that during the first service. Let's keep going. I'm going to pray for people here, but let's all raise our voices together. Just say this with me, everybody. Come on, just say this with the person who's saying it the first time. And if you said it a hundred times, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the cross where my sins were forgiven. I am no longer an orphan. I belong to you. I will serve you. I will follow you. I will walk with you. I will be all you've called me to be. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout amen and let's celebrate.